Good afternoon and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. This is Andre Taylor, and I'm so pleased you decided to join me for this webinar, Performing Arts Marketing Redefined. We have folks from various arts organizations, uh, music, film, dance, ticketing, even some folks in um, comedy who have joined us all across the country. Among other things, we'll be talking about luxury positioning, affluent audiences, distinguished partners, loyalty, and membership. So once again, thank you for joining me today. Let's get started and uh, share some of these ideas with you. I'm a musician turned marketer. I grew up playing the piano. I graduated from the High School of Music and Art where I played oboe in the orchestra. I am a big fan of the arts and I have been all my life. Whether it's piano, which I, I still play, film, fine art, dance. I'm perhaps most fond of jazz and classical. And if any of you have seen any of my YouTube videos, you can see in the background a wall of jazz musicians, photographs that I've collected over the years. Now, over the years, I've worked with many arts organizations. And, and I looked around and realized that we, meaning Taylor Insight, could be helpful during this period. Broadway has been dark for over a year. Some arts organizations have completely shut down, furloughing employees, and, and the arts category has faced probably its most challenging moments. There has been limited programming, limited live programming, that is. But of course, we expect openings in Q3, Q4. So, so we are right at the cusp of some change. You have not only the folks that buy tickets to, uh, to see and hear your performances and see your films and participate in what you offer. You also have board members. You also have some people who donate to you who might not even come to the events. You have fans, enthusiasts, you have the musicians, the people who work within the, the field. It's the relationship that matters most. And uh, you know, I'm a big jazz fan. I haven't stopped looking at jazz at Lincoln Center. I've been looking at what they're, they're streaming. I'm looking online to see what the musicians are doing. I'm corresponding with musicians. I'm looking at interviews. I'm reading. I'm very much engaged in that still because it's not just something I do on occasion, sporadically. It, it's a part of my life. And the goal here is to find more and more people who are like that and who want to be like that, but most important, to, to really support those who have already identified that they are aligned in that way. Or arts organizations typically have wonderful missions. Now, some, some organizations are, have to re, you know, have to look at their mission again. Uh, because sometimes their mission, particularly when it's done by committee, it can expand and be all over the place and not be very focused. But often, while having a wonderful mission, the organization might not expect it to convert financially. And I often cringe when I talk to people who run arts organizations because they don't expect what they do to convert financially. Many organizations have this as a factor. There's also the factor of often not being entrepreneurial enough, not being agile enough, not being opportunity driven. As a marketer, you must be always opportunity driven because your real business is marketing your organization. It is not just presenting great music in a great experience and a great event. It's about looking at your organization and aligning that focus with, with someone like me who, when he's going through t the television or going through radio, would have to, if I happen to hear someone from a, 
jazz group or orchestra or whatever, I'm going to stop and I'm going to listen to that. The other piece of this is limited vision. And that is staying within the echo chamber and not expanding in scope. Something has happened and we should take note of it. Some arts organizations, perhaps you, have learned some interesting things. The first is that streaming programming can generate revenues. There are people at home who might not travel into town and go into your theater to see what you have to offer. But they don't want to see another crime show on television. They don't want to see another reality show. They don't want to hear about the political infighting. They want to be enchanted by the beautiful stories and the beautiful music that comes out of your organization that can put them in a completely different world, which is often why we go in person. So streaming programming can generate revenues. Digital can and should be integrated into your strategic plan. So I've heard some organizations say, well, when we open again, which is valid, of course, but let's not lose sight of this moment and how this is accelerating a focus and understanding and appreciation of something that perhaps we didn't give a lot of attention to. The third thing is the value of archival performances and content is greater than you may be aware. It might be old to you, it might be the past to you, even things like your, your internal events, your, your galas, your activities that you don't think are necessarily appropriate. Obviously, these are things that are within your catalog that can be shared and can be leveraged. The final thing on this slide is that you're not limited to serving audiences in your building or in your community. That's the most exciting thing to me about this world that we're in. You can and should have a global audience. I listen to music that's coming from all over the globe, as I'm sure you do. I listen to content from all over the globe, whether it's a broadcast of some kind, whether it's news, whether it's a podcast, whatever it is. I have clients all over the globe. Every week I'm talking to people in, in various countries about their marketing and what we like to call Taylor Insight style marketing with them and how they can apply it to their organizations. So you can and you should have a global audience. And one of the great things that's happened as a result of the pandemic is many arts organizations have begun to think outside of the building and in bigger ways. And, and that is, that's beautiful. Facts about art organizations and opportunity. Number one, there's enough money in this world to make your organization successful financially. There's a lot of money in this world, irrespective of what experiences you may have. So keep that in mind. Getting it flowing through your organization is vital. It's vital to your mission of providing the art that you care about. When you understand that there's enough, and number two, you understand that it's vital, you know, that changes your, your approach a little bit. More focus must be on generating money via your assets versus asking for money. Now, of course, as arts organizations, you want the generosity of those who value what you offer and who are willing to donate and support your organization. That's, that has been a reliable and important source of support but often what we do when it comes down to the nonprofit sector is we don't think so much about the values we align with, with our audiences and what we are giving them as much as what they can give us. It's important that you keep in the forefront this idea of what you give to the world and give to your community and understanding how you can convey that in new ways, in more powerful ways, more exciting ways, and in ways 
that reaffirm your own belief in what you do and your capacity to do it. You may ask, why luxury positioning? Uh, why affluent audiences? Why loyalty? Why membership? Let's, let's talk about that now. This is a fundamental idea that the most successful art organizations in the world understand. No organization today can be blind to the differences in income and wealth among their target audiences. While many arts organizations are hopeful to capture the masses, discretionary income, high income and wealth are determining factors when it comes to engaging in the arts. If your audiences are affluent, you'd better understand them better and deepen relationships. If your audiences are not affluent, you'd better understand how to attract those with the highest discretionary income. That's an important statement to remember because many organizations are aiming for whoever they can get. Discretionary income is rising. There's a lot of talk about income equality today, and that's something that is worth exploring more deeply. But what's not often understood is there's greater discretionary income for many today. And it might not seem that way because our standards of living have increased in significant ways but we may not notice it. $5 cups of coffee, $1,000 cell phones, $3,000 computers, all quite common today. So depending on who you market to and who your marketing is aimed at, or better said, what aspect of your marketing is aimed at who? you will find audiences with different ways of using their discretionary funds. You have people who are looking at their experiences and thinking, okay, I want entertainment as part of my experiences day to day routine. But then you have people who are looking at their own identity and status as an individual. And they want that luxury sedan. They want that high end apartment. They also want art experiences. You know, maybe we'll go to the museum this afternoon and maybe we'll become a member. Maybe we'll get season tickets to the uh, ballpark. Maybe we'll get tickets to the orchestra. Maybe we'll become a donor. These are often attached to one's own sense of arrival in life. Don't take your eye off of the person who is seeking a level of identity and status and who has discretionary income because that number is growing and it's growing in a major way. So there's a challenge here. And let me describe the challenge. It's getting someone to do it. And I describe it as partaking in your offering whether it's your uh, performance, you know, coming to your venue, it's getting someone to do it more than once because the experienced person will do it once. <laughs> they will do all kinds of things once. The question is, how do we align with the person who is, wants to do it more than once? And how do we also paint a beautiful picture for person who might be interested in doing it more than once, where it's not just an experience, but it's part of their life. And to do this, you have to get beyond your programming, beyond your website, beyond your clever short-term maneuvers as an art organ arts organization, to understanding your most lucrative buyer and nurturing them long-term. So it's turning patrons and customers into lifelong members. Let me describe this challenge in another way. 
it is not trying to get the average person to discover and love classical music or whatever it is you offer, whatever art it is you offer. It is getting the person already in the right mindset, the right income, the right discretionary level to see what you offer as essential to who they are.